Hello, I'm Dr. Ian McCullough. The case we're going to look at now involves address resolution for the U.S. Postal Service. So during the COVID pandemic, if you recall, in the U.S., the White House announced that it would mail a COVID test kit to every household in the U.S. Oddly, however, they had not coordinated this announcement with the post office in advance. So one of my team members who was working on our U.S. Postal Service account heard about this via the news, and she knew the requirement would come to her team. So over the weekend, prior to receiving any official direction from the government, she developed a request page that verified the address so that a household couldn't request multiple tests. Now, this initiative, by the way, by my estimation, saved the American taxpayers about $4 billion based on the number of duplicate requests that hit that site. But uh, the project also had uh, an issue where uh, there was a number of addresses where they should have been able to get a kit, but because of poor address resolution, they weren't able to actually access it. And you would think that that this could have been resolved by, by things like uh, reaching into the U.S. Census Bureau and you know some of the other agencies, and all of that was done, but it still left about 300,000 service requests of people that said, hey, I should get a COVID test kit, and you've kind of denied me. And, and part of that problem would be that in rural communities and outlying territories, postal workers simply knew the people in their communities, and they didn't always rely on accurate addresses. Or another common problem might be the university dormitory where the first student that requests the test kit gets one and then the second uh, student does not. And, and you would find that that varied. So like, uh, you know, I believe at like University of Florida, every dorm uh, room was able to get their own test kit. But you go to, I think, UCLA and it was one for the entire uh, dormitory. Uh, <clears throat> so... These 300,000 service requests that the post office was, was uh, receiving, which you know I'd point out is, is under 1% of the population, so that's pretty good, uh, but it still was overwhelming this ill-equipped service center. And so they proposed using a machine learning classifier to see if they could help uh, resolve some of the requests. So this is an example of enhanced customer experience, or in this case, citizen experience, by, by being able to kind of reduce that burden that you have in a call center. So uh, there were generally five categories. Uh, there was uh, a business address, which meant that a person using uh, their home address and their business out of the same address, so uh, they couldn't resolve uh, those things. There would be like a shared address, which is where uh, a person has multiple families are using the same address, you know, multi-generation homes, or sometimes you'll have two completely different households that are sharing the same address. There's issues of multiple addresses, duplicate addresses, or other. So five different categories. And unfortunately, the best classifier that they could train was about 84% accurate. And that wasn't high enough for the government to consider using it. So meanwhile, the White House is uh, demanding daily reports on the progress of mailing the test kits. And so the first step that I took in, in coming into this problem was to ask the postal workers to evaluate 200 randomly chosen service requests to just evaluate the interannotator agreement on those cases. So they only annotated uh, probably less than 100 of the cases, and we measured the disagreement rate to be about 16%. So right then, already the machine learning classifier was already performing at the level of human agreement. And so <clears throat> the next step is to kind of look at the cases of disagreement and refine some of the standards. And as, as I was going through this process, uh, I asked, well, what are you going to do if somebody has a business address and a home address, right? If, if you determine that the business address, uh, this is a business address, what are you going to do? They're going to just mail them a kit because they found to try and resolve that issue would be more expensive in labor and time than the cost of the test kit. So they might as well just send it. And so I said, well, what else are you going to do? Well, it was the same for a shared address. But when we get into the issue of multiple address or duplicate address, Maybe there's an area for uh, applying some sort of regular expressions or some other processing to kind of resolve those addresses. And anything in the other bucket would have a manual review. So the solution to resolving this was a little more nuanced. So we want natural language processing to resolve 300 service requests. And so if we take the service request data and we put it into a machine learning model that's going to classify one of five categories that I just described, well, two of those categories, we're just going to mail them a kit. Two of those categories, we could add an additional module and focus developers to do better address resolution using regular expressions. 
And then that other category is always going to be manual review. Well, coming out of that address resolution, we can either uh, send it to the mail it or send it to the check it category. What that did is it took the amount of automatic mailings from 44% to 60%. So you're getting a significant improvement in instant mailings. The overall quality of this classifier was 97% accurate to human agreement. So it's actually probably a little better than that human consistency. Keep in mind when I asked the postal workers to, to do an inter annotator agreement study, they had a 16% disagreement rate. So the fact that we are able to have 97% accuracy in our mailings uh, was pretty significant. It was much better than human agreement. And so in this way, they were able to immediately send about you know, uh, two thirds of those cases out for, uh, for, for immediate mailing, uh, which helped reduce the backlog tremendously. So I'd like to point out that this project was an incredible logistical feat. Uh, approximately 270 million test kits were mailed to households within about 30 hours of the post office receiving them, which is pretty impressive. What I think is interesting, if we look back at the slide, is when we look at the households that were impacted by each of these five categories, what you're seeing is the five categories across the bottom and the vertical uh, axis is representing the uh, the annual income, uh, household income. And so, you know, you can see that that the distribution is well below the median income uh, for any of these cases. So what we see is the, the people that are most impacted by the address resolution problem were not the wealthy, they were the most economically disadvantaged households. So what I think is interesting about that is if you think about the business decision initially was that 84% accuracy was not sufficient for them to take action. You know, and it's probably wise to look at how you can boost that performance, how you can go back to some of that inter annotator agreement and make sure you have consistent training data to get a better outcome. I also think it's interesting to think how you're going to deploy that classifier. So uh, yes, there's a machine learning classifier that's going to look at five different criteria, but you know, at the end of the day, what you're really trying to do is make a decision about mailing it or not mailing it. So the way you structure that and the way you integrate the, the AI and the decisions is part of that deployment phase, which is kind of interesting. But the most interesting thing I think is this realization that withholding the AI solution hurts the most vulnerable portions of our society more than it impacts the wealthy. And so if you keep in mind, the, the Postal Service was initially hesitant because it only performed at 84% accuracy. Well, isn't it better to uh, at least do that than to uh, adversely impact those that might in, be in most need of the test kits? So this is why I think that fear of AI, which is usually born of ignorance about the technology, can often lead to excessive regulations that restrict the beneficial uses of AI and end up hurting those that are most in need. So I hope you found this case study interesting. I'm Dr. Ian McCullough with Johns Hopkins.